right, so if you weren't here last week, and there's no way for me to know, last week was really kind of crazy. You know, it was a little bit, little bit of those, those verses, you know, and, I, and all week long I thought of things I didn't explain very well. You know, I just think that's what happens when you do this job. And, uh, you know, the, the, the story was um, the Pharisees are listening and they're getting mad at Jesus. They're scoffing at him. And he, he tells this whole story about, you know, um, the law is not going to pass away and, and that they, what they do trying to, you know, make the laws of God serve them is detestable to God is what they said. And he said, and then Jesus says this divorce scripture. So in it is this uh, phrase that in Matthew is said a certain way. It said, uh, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. And that has been something everybody has just kind of, I don't know, misinterpreted, misused all my life. I've never understood it. I've never said it in a way that understood it until I understood that what he's talking about is the law and the prophet is till John, and that John, the kingdom started being preached, but what men have always done in the law and the prophet and the kingdom of God is strong-arm it and twist it into what they want it to be so they can use it how they want to use it, and then he used the divorce scripture. Remember yesterday I said it's like somebody picked up a piece of paper that had a divorce scripture on it, and they said, oh, where do we put this? Oh, peg it there. Like it didn't fit. It never has fit in my life, and Yet the understanding of this, he used it as the example to prove to them that they take the law of God and twist it to their own way, but because they give certificates of divorce and allow divorce. So, and then I told you that the good news for Christian, New Testament Christians is that divorce is not the unforgivable sin. Do all of you recognize that? Yeah, and that there is forgiveness for divorce in, in, under the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm not sure about Christians getting divorced, and it's not my call. I'm not the judge, but that's up to you. And so, I, and I don't know how to explain that for you. Now, it, it's, it, I mean, he tells the divorce scripture in verse 18, and then moves on to 19, which is where I'm going to start reading. This is the next part of this continuation. Now, there was a rich man, and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen joyously living in splendor every day. And a poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gate covered with sores, longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table. Besides, even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. Now the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom, heaven. Okay, And the rich man also died and was buried in Hades, which is hell. He lifted up his eyes being in torment, and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom in heaven. He cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your life you received many good things, and likewise Lazarus had bad things, but now he is being confirmed Front, con- comforted here, and you are in agony. That word just makes me shiver, agony. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a real great chasm, fixed so that those who wish to come over from here to you wouldn't be able, and that none may cross over from here to us, from there to us, I'm sorry. And he said, then I beg you, Father, that you send him to my father's house. Not the Father's house. Not the Father's house church. Come on. That guy. For I have five brothers in order that he may warn them so that they will also not also come to this place of torment. Father Abraham said, they have Moses and prophets. Let them hear them. He said, no other. No, no. He said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But but Abraham said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded, even if someone rises from the dead. There is just way too many Christian veins to preach in here. You know, like there's just way too many. We really could stay on this for a while because of what you and I have habitually done and what the Christian church in the Western world across the borders, I'm not even talking about a denomination. 
a ecumenicals versus evangelicals. I'm not talking about even any stream. I'm talking about widespread abuses that we take the kingdom of God the, the, and we twist it to our liking. And then we end up with 80 denominations doing completely, interpreting in so many different ways. And it's like the kingdom of heaven is not going to pass in that way. The words of Jesus are not going to pass away. And, it, it, and for the rich man in this story, it's somewhat too late to hear what he could have heard, to listen to what he could have listened to, respond to what he could have responded to, do what he could have done, believe what he could have believed. You following me? You can see that I could go on for quite some time with the next phrase and the next phrase, what we should have done, thought what we should have thought, seen what we should have seen done what we should have done. It just can go on and on. So here's Lazarus, this poor man. And these words, the wording of this description are so important. Lazarus is laying by a gate waiting for the crumbs from the rich man's table. I've always thought that was strange because, you know, crumbs, I guess, how would they get to the gate? So so you look up history and you, um, you see the tradition of the rich in... Israel and Jerusalem. So a rich man doesn't have paper napkins, but he has this abundance of meat, this extravagant food, and it says every day, and if it means every day, then he's including the Sabbath, which is he's, he's a lawbreaker. But we don't know that. That's not in the story. But every day he has plentiful meat, whereas the average person in Israel for that day may have meat once in a while. Maybe the rich would have it once a week, but this guy is so rich, he has it every day. And so they have no napkins, and so what they used was loaves of bread that were made specifically to wipe grease. And wiped grease bread then gets discarded, taken down to the gate where the poor wait, and that's all the food they get in their life. And so the, you know the lady saying, don't the dogs deserve the crumbs from the table? She was referring to this also, this, this act of poor people in and even the leper colonies, what they would bring them in the baskets would be the discarded bread from using bread as, as wiping up grease. And so um, the rich man wore purple every day, which purple is a color that's vastly expensive to create, and only the most rich people wear pur purple. And they, you know, living in splendor every day. And, and so you think about what's, what's the problem with this. I mean, if I were to take a secret poll anyway, if I were to take a paper, don't put your name on it, would you like to live in splendor every day? We just do a, a questionnaire. Would you like to be richer than you are? Would you like, you know, you saw a picture of a yacht. Would you like to have a yacht? Or at least be able to ride in yachts, you know? Would you like to be able to travel the world? Everybody, yeah. So you want to be rich. If I could guarantee you winning the lottery tomorrow, would you buy a $1 ticket to win the lottery tomorrow? Don't you want to be rich? But I remind you of maybe some of the words that described the end result of this rich man, agony and torment. So let's just take the idea, just a, just a you know, I was looking at kites yesterday thinking, man, you, I would really want a long, 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 long kite string. I like flying kites when they're, they can go way, way out there, right? You know, it's these big, powerful kites that are, and I thought, man, there isn't a rope long enough for me to want to buy that kite, because I really would like to fly it way out there, right? Well, if life were like a rope, and eternity was like a rope, then that rope would, there is no even an imagination of how long of a rope you would need to spend eternity. And this agony and this discomfort, this torment, is eternity, and the Abraham in the story says, we can't even come to you if we wanted to. There's a chasm. We are blocked. You are permanently fixed in this torment. And it's the idea of this story is eternal, eternity. And if you were to take this rope and stretch it out what eternity means, there is no way to give you an idea of the length. One time around the world, 20 times around the world. 2,000 times, there is no end to this eternal rope. And there is no end, is the point. 
And our life starts at a fixed point on that rope. It just, I, I, I always pause at a picture, say, of a, of a 19, 1860s picture of Civil War or something with a crowd. Every single one of those people have passed, passed from the face of the earth. Or some other, you know, event in history where photographs are still, are, you know, a movie about Roman times. Well, everyone they're depicting, that's a, that civilization existed and they have ended. And not a single human being of any kind is still on the face of the earth. They have all passed. And so let's say this clip on the rope at the beginning of your life and a clip on the rope at the end of your life is this little tiny blip on the rope that makes up eternity. And they're talking about Lazarus had this horridly miserable description. Dogs licking his sores, waiting for somebody else to bring him greasy bread to eat while he's starving to death. He had this time that is horrible, is terrible, is not to be wanted. And Lazarus, and the rich man had this opulent everyday wonder and grace of eating, eating richly and lavishly every day, wearing purple robes. He had a gate. He had a fence. He had a mansion for this little tiny time where his life began, his life ended. But the rest of the rope never ends. It just goes on and on. And on and on. This one, the poor guy, yes, it was horrible. It was, the description just, it's just lo dogs licking, longing to be fed. I mean, just do that for a day or two, long to be fed. And it's a horrible, it makes that little short time seem like a long time. Seventy years gets a lot longer when you're longing to be fed every day. But eternity in Abraham's bosom. This guy here, man, all of us want to be just like him. And we want to take the kingdom of heaven and we want to take it by force. And where it says it's impossible, it's so hard for a rich man to get to heaven. Why, a camel could pass through the eye of a needle easier than a rich man can get to heaven. And we say, no, I want to be a rich man. And we string, yeah, we bend the kingdom of God to say, see, it's okay for me. And you get to do that. You have my permission, God's permission, everyone's permission to do that. Make it however you want it to be. Then live what you want it to be, but understand, there's this eternity. I made it a rope. I don't care what you make it. It's eternity. Your life is like a grain of sand in it. But in this life, we just all want to be rich. And, and it's really hard to get that eternal blessing rich. But I want to be rich. But it's really hard to get that eternal blessing and be rich. But I want to be rich. And I hate what Steve's saying, so I'm not going to go to church here anymore. Yes. <laughs> well, trust me, I get the letters. I, I, some people just feel they have to tell me why. So I get the letters, and I'm just like, yeah, but how did going and finding another crowd of people who want to wrestle the truth to be what they want it to be? <laughs> how to get an agreement, taking a survey until you find... Oh, I found someone that agrees with me. Whew. So that you can both be looking at Abraham's bosom saying, please, a drip of water, please. Now the both of you are? What good does it do? Because you know it isn't Steve saying this. It's not Steve making this up. The only thing that I commit to being a, just a dumb carpenter called to be a pastor, the only thing I got as to you, I promise you that all I will ever do is tell you what he says. You come here 30 years from now, if I'm 97, still pastor in this church, if my blip hasn't ended, <laughs> you know, I'll be real close to the end of that blip. Yeah, it won't be 70, but that 97-year blip, I'll still be reading you what Jesus says. There is no end for me to reading what Jesus says. 
my whole Christian philosophy. Met him one night, read Revelation, said, oh no, this guy's serious. He's real and he's serious. That's like, whoa, couldn't he have just been like faking it? Couldn't he have not really meant what he said? No, he meant what he said. This is clear. So it's like, uh, uh, what do you want me to do? Just tell him what I said. Took me one time to this story of the demoniac. I want to go with you. I mean, which of us wouldn't? Jesus is walking out the door. Can, can we go with you? Can we go with you? I want to go with him. You guys stay here. I'm going. Or come with me. I don't care. I'm going. He's going. No, he says, you stay here. I felt so bad for that demoniac. He just got free. And Jesus says, no, you stay here. But you know what he said to him? Stay here and tell them the wondrous things God has done for you. Why? So maybe they'll quit living lavishly and ignoring the suffering at their gate. Maybe those five brothers will listen to something because you have a story. They all know you to be crazy demoniac. And then now they're going to know you to be free and, and, and so much richer in joy and peace and patience and kindness filled with the presence of God. Again, why are we born again? Why? How come the night I met him, he didn't just zip me to heaven? Let's get this over with. Amen. Don't leave me here where I can blow it. Where I can walk away. Don't leave me here where I can stop. Take me. Yeah. <laughs> Why? No, you stay. I want to go with you. I want to be where you are. You know, and that's just, listen, that's just totally wrong thinking. You know why? He came to where I was. And I'm trying to go where he is, but he's with me. You see, why are we born again? To become his image on the earth. For others to see him. If somebody had gone to the rich man, he still would have stuck with his money. But he would have had a shot. It wasn't until he was in agony that he said, oh, no, I blew it. I put all my hope in money. All of my fear about money took over. All of my love of opulence and comfort, all of my fear took over. And he saw Lazarus and said, please send him. No. Why are we born again? What we have prayer meetings about, about cars and keys and bank accounts. And we have huge gatherings about how to invest for the future. How to save for a bigger building. Instead of, how do I make sure that that little blip doesn't get me into a long line of agony? How do I make sure that that little blip ends up continuing for eternity? See, I met him way back here in my blip. I already have this much of a blip of life. I met him way back here. So it's not here on. It's actually from here on. You see, he said the kingdom of heaven is here. When you pray, pray, let your kingdom come. The kingdom of heaven has already started for me. If, it's, if I'm in agony here, I'm going to be in agony there. But if there is agonizing things happening to me, but I have the fruit of the Holy Spirit, then I have joy in my heart. Then I have peace in my life. I have eternal life already began for me. We start early. We jump the gun by meeting Jesus and allowing ourselves to surrender to him and become like him and become formed into the image of him. To become, when people look at us as a community, they say, what is this thing? They walked around the Lights of Hope, 22,000 people visited us. I don't know how many are Christians and how many are not, I don't know. But all I heard constantly was, what is this feeling here? What is this atmosphere? It's the Lord. This is the, this is the presence of God. And you've been allowed to feel and see. I don't care about a lights of hope. I don't care about mud runs. I don't care about gyms, yogurts. I don't care about anything we do as something we do. I care about demonstrating the presence and power of God on the earth. Now, I do have a lot of associates that maybe even got saved in my season. They've been pastors as long as I do. And all they want are the blind to see and the lame to walk. But I have found that the blind see and still go to hell. I have found that the lame walk and still don't believe. 
I have seen people I can, I go, well, wait a minute. I remember you. You were sleeping in an alley. I remember you. You were miserable. I remember you, how bound up you were. But during the years you walked with us, you had joy. You had peace. You had goodness in your life. Come back to it. Don't you remember seeing him? He was here with you. Don't you remember feeling him? And so when I pray, I say, thank you for loving us, Lord. But that's just, so, that's just such a small piece of it. Your power in my life, your joy, your fruit, your presence, just being willing to live in me. This is what I want. I don't want food at the gate. I want food that lasts forever. I want the manna that comes down from heaven, the, the bread of life, the river of water. I want that all. Not then, but I, don't, I want it now. I want it with me, in me. And I have had it now these 48 years. And I don't know why everybody, is, if there was a dollar ticket, if I just buy this dollar ticket, I can have God's presence in my life. You, could, I would, you would think you could sell a billion tickets, but you can't. Yes. Say, you can get a billion dollars. The lottery's up to a billion. It's only a dollar. You want it? They sell a billion tickets. You see what I'm saying? There's this movement going on in Asbury, Kentucky. Fox News calls them up and says, can we bring crews? <laughs> They call him back and said, would you please not? We love your show. This has nothing to do with you. We love you. We, 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 all of us leaders watch you, Fox News. But please, this is not about the news. This isn't about politics. This isn't about anything. This is about worship. And we'd like you to, we, we're not going to let your cameras in. Please don't even come to the university. See, they, I think they're getting it right. It's not about teaching anything. It's not about anything other than come in this room, worship him, and experience him. And if, you're, and if you're lucky, I would say, you begin to be transformed into his image. You begin to become like him. You begin to be, get his, what he got. I, I, I want to see the blind healed. I want to, but I don't want to see it as a spectacle like, you know, the performing circus uh, act. I don't want to see come come see you know little Lena the lady with a beard. I don't want to come see the guy with two heads. I want to come I want to come and see the King of Heaven and the Lord over all the earth, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world in my life. I have no idea why He would want me in His life, but He does. I do understand why he wants you, but I don't understand why he wants me, but he does. I think you feel the same. You look around and say, there's a lot of worthy people, but he wants you. He does. And I don't want to be the poor man licking, dogs licking my sores, but I have had some trouble in this here world. I want to be able to have peace when the trouble comes. I want to have this glory of God in my life, this him speaking through me, when I touch, he touches. Where I go, he goes. My little blip on the, remember the eternal rope? And my little blip of life? I don't want it to start here. I want it to have started here. I want to have my mind right. I've had crazy thoughts. I've had temper take over. I've had lust take over. I've had greed take over. Standing as hard as I could against fear of being broke, I was living in fear of being broke until I was broke and said, this ain't so bad. We walked out, Vicki and I, I don't, I don't want to say the whole story, we walked into this parking lot holding hands, feeling like the biggest failures on earth, and I'm, I'm feeling terrible for her, she's feeling terrible for me, and all of a sudden it's like, but I don't feel terrible for me. I feel like I've been set free. I didn't lose anything. I got rid of it all. It was shocking. And she I was just like, I didn't want, I, you know, I don't know what she's thinking. But she, then she said the same thing. I feel like we've been set free. I've had a lot and I've had a little. And the only thing that matters is do I have him? The only thing that matters is I, am I in the kingdom? And here's the greatest fear of this whole thing. And I 
I have to tell you that he's going to go into the stumbling block stuff. But right now he's talking about religious people. And that's you and me, even though we say, we are no, I'm not going to let my relationship get overcome by religion. No, I'm not going to let my religion block my relationship. Well, we do. Sorry to tell you, but we do. And then we get all religious, and I mean, we look terrible. What we need to be on guard for, on guard. Right? Do not let yourself wrestle the kingdom of God into what you want it to be. But instead, wrestle your own life into fitting what it is already. You've heard of the round peg in the square hole? Whatever shape the kingdom of heaven is, then allow yourself to be whittled into that shape and make a perfect fit. Boom. What is that word? Symmetry. Let yourself be molded into what God wants you to be so that you walk in kingdom living with kingdom truth, telling the story of Jesus Christ. Heaven and earth will pass away. The law and the prophets will pass away. But my words will never pass away. Now, we just read where he said the law and the prophets, not an iota can be taken away, but God's going to take them away. My words will never pass away. I have found these to be, I, I have decided to be a biblical Christian. And the words I live by are the red letters. The, the, the letters from the Christian apostles govern my life. The whole rest of the Old Testament, no governance whatsoever. They tell me who God is. And I say, he gets mad when these things happen. That means he still gets mad when those things happen. I don't want to do those things. I don't want him mad. I want to do what he wants me to do. And what he wants me to do is follow Jesus, listen to Jesus, imitate Jesus. Let me finish with the same story. I, I mean, I preach this all over the world. He took three guys up a hill, met Moses and Elijah on the way. They'd been taught all their life to worship Moses and Elijah. Flat out worship. Almost gods. They were so excited. We got Jesus, we got Moses, we got Elijah. Let me make three altars to worship them. And, and I think today you and I have way more than three altars. We have, we, our constant battle is not to make altars and then say it's okay to have these altars. I will bend my Christianity to say that's okay. This is okay. I'm okay. No. Whatever he says, that's okay with me. That settles it. On the way up the hill, they say, it's good we're here. We'll make three altars. And the father spoke out of the cloud and said, this is my son listen to him. This is my son. Listen to him. And here at the Father's House Church, we're going to try as hard as we can to spend the rest of our life, whatever, the, whatever time we have left, listening to him and acting upon it. Anyone who hears these words of mine, which you're going to hear him in here, and I'm sorry, if you don't want to hear his words, don't come here. You're going to hear his words. Anyone who hears these words and acts upon them is like the wise man who dug his house deep into the rock and built his foundation on the rock. And when the winds blew and the waves crashed, that house stood because it was built on the rock. The words of Jesus will never pass away. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Amen? Amen? Yeah! I love Jesus. Those of you that are leaving us this week and going back to where you came from, not just the Campbells, but we, our school also got out this week, and uh, some foreigners are leaving to go back home. They have, some of them have to go. Some of them, some of them just that's God's plan for their life. And so I just want to say goodbye to you. Uh, it has not goodbye forever, but just uh, till we meet again. And it's been a blessing to have you here. The... Um, the subject of money, Jesus brings up over and over and over and over. And all of us have been hurt. All of us have been afraid. A lot of us have been poor and abandoned. And that money is pretty secure to trust in. But I got to tell you, I can't change it for you. And I'm sorry that you have to hear this all the time if this is your struggle. 
But if you come here, I'm going to just preach what Jesus preaches. And he preaches more about money than any other thing as the reason men can't go to heaven. And I would just be mortified that you came and sat in these chairs, amen to everything I said, and then did not, did not make it to heaven. Come and surrender yourself to the Lord. And when you do, surrender your money, your time, and your energy. Surrender your life. Don't come asking to add him to your life, asking to add you to his life. Come and give your life to him. Meet him. Find out he's real. If you know he's real, find out what he says. Do what he says, and I can promise you something. Whether you're the guy wearing purple robes or the guy eating bread that wiped up grease, there's going to be a lot longer period of time called eternity where you're going to be in the riches of Abraham's bosom or you're going to be in Hades. That's just the way it is. That's what he says. And I just encourage you to respond to the call of God. Hear these words of his and act upon them. Get free from the bondage of this world. Amen. Close your eyes and bow your heads. Father, I pray your conviction. I pray your conviction today for all of us. I might think I'm okay, but maybe you know I'm not, and I'm asking you to show me wherever I have gone astray. Can you pray that prayer, my friends? Show me where I'm not following you. Show me where I'm not trusting you. Show me where I'm not even seeing the suffering around me because I'm so afraid to give up what's mine. I'm afraid to be generous. I'm afraid to be penniless. Would you pray that prayer? Would you come to the altar and seek him? Feel free to come now if you want, but, or bow in your chair. Bow where you're at. Seek him and find him. Cry out to him and be forgiven for where you have fallen short. Seek him and find him and cry out to him. Seek him and find him and cry out to him and be forgiven. And then afterwards, if you, if you are being forgiven, turn around and do something extravagant to break free from the bondages of your, your, bond, your bindings. He has come to set the captive free. Hallelujah. 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 Praise the Lord. Thanks for watching the Father's House Orville YouTube channel, but don't stop there. We'd love you to subscribe to our channel so that you never miss a live service or a video. Help us spread the message of Jesus by sharing this video with your friends. You can also support the Father's House financially by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for watching today, and we hope to see you again soon.